he said, philosophy between brackets nature is written in that great book which ever is before our eyes. I mean the, the universe. But we cannot understand it if we do not first learn the language and grasp the symbols in which it is written. The book is written in mathematical language and the symbols are triangles, circles and other geometrical figures. Without whose help it is impossible to, to comprehend a single word of it. Without which one wanders in vain through a dark labyrinth. Uh, please uh, welcome Donald and Boyce uh, Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Samir. Thank you, Michael, yeah, for inviting me here to be with you. Uh, I'm down to give you a lecture. I'd rather not. <laughs> I'd rather have a talk with you as a monk's friend. In English, we would say a heart to heart. So it's kind of a conversation, but I'm going to be the one talking. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to do my best to talk to you from my heart. That is what motivates and moves me about what I do, which I'm going to share with you. And I invite you on your part to listen with your heart as well as your mind. Hi. Can you do that? Is that good? And if we're friends and we're having a conversation then either I sit down for an hour or you all stand up for an hour. <laughs> But I take it, you'd rather do it this way. So, um, three parts. I've got some slides to share with you. The first part, my understanding of geometry, what it means, what it means to me. Second part, share with you some of the work I've done using geometry as an architect. And the third part, some thoughts, philosophical thoughts about the wider context of practicing architecture. And this is billed as geometry key to beauty in architecture. So we love keys, don't we? The Vinci Code, Secrets of the Universe. You can probably Google Secrets of the Universe. And if the Google angels are on your side, you will get who knows what. So apparently, I'm going to give you tonight the key to beauty. But you, each of you, will have to find the lock. <laughs> there are, and there are many of them, many doors to open. So let me avoid pressing the wrong button. Beauty. Beauty is that which stuns, it has been said, stuns. In other words, it stops the mind, stops the thinking, the chattering mind. And here's an exercise which is actually quite interesting. Try and breathe consciously, focusing on your breathing. And actually, if you do it, you can't think. If you find yourself thinking, 
you've lost focus on your breathing. It's quite interesting. So I'm asking you to do something. You're going to listen with your heart as well as your head. So you've got to do this double act. Beauty stuns, <clears throat> kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, stops the mind momentarily, and it evokes in you, connects you with something very deep and precious. Connects you. I'd like to read you a poem which you, or part of a poem that you probably all know. To see a world in a grain of sand. You know this one? And a heaven in a wild flower. This is heaven. Hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. So that's what beauty is about. Unfortunately, the word beauty has been misappropriated, misused somewhat, so that in England, for example, football, I think you'd call it soccer, is called the beautiful game. I'm not talking about that kind of beauty. I'm not talking about a, an opinion, oh, that's a beautiful picture, that's a beautiful chair. I'm talking about something rather more fundamental than that. If you like beauty with a capital B, the biggest beauty you can think of, the highest, the most profound. And if you encounter that sort of beauty, it stuns you, it stops your breath. Something inside you goes like that, yeah? You know what I mean? Does this, does this mean something to you? Okay, geometry. Earth measure. I told the students this afternoon that the compasses that they were using are a very old instrument. It is God using them? So they go back to before the beginning. Um, earth measure, but not in the sense of surveying. That's kind of like the lowest grade of what I'm, I'm meaning more geometry in the sense of those measures, those patterns that were used to draw out the universe. The patterns of creation, if you like. That's what geometry means to me, the patterns of creation. completely inseparable, in my view, from an understanding of our place and purpose in the world. It has that depth of meaning. Yes. Here we are. Flowers, geometry. So, you can see beautiful quote from Galileo. Thank you. Um, here is nature telling you about geometry just for free. Every moment of the day is just making these beautiful images for you. And of course, just as each one of us is completely unique, so each potentilla flower is completely unique. 
and behind the flower there is a pattern. There is a pattern without which that flower could not be. The pattern comes first, the flower expresses it. In many ways in nature, visible and invisible, a flower top left, uh, bottom left, I think is quite a familiar image these days. Uh, 1955, I believe it's the first picture of atomic structure. And because atoms are pretty small, it's not a very sharp image for obvious reasons. But you can just make out there's a whole series of rippling circles, concentric circles from many, many different centers. Those circles are made up of dots, which are atoms. So you're seeing a pattern of rippling atoms. And here's geometry in a spiral, an X-ray of a shell in the center, honeycomb, beautiful, natural, hexagonal stacking, and a spiral galaxy at the top. And interesting that Galileo is saying that you cannot understand what is behind these unless you understand the patterns, the language, the notes with which these tunes are composed. And um, on your right is my teacher, my teacher of geometry, Keith Critchlow, who was discovered, I think it's probably fair to say, by your Bucky Fuller. And they collaborated for some time, but it was Bucky Fuller who recognized the work that Keith was doing and, if you like, pulled him out of his solo journey and encouraged him to publish and teach and, and so forth. And I met and started working with Keith 30 years ago. So. I've been learning geometry for 30 years and um, still feel a bit of a beginner. And Keith Critchlow taught us geometry from a platonic point of view. And actually these five solids are called the five platonic solids. Yes, I was going to say that the difference between a lecture and a talk is that in a lecture, halfway through, half of the people are asleep and they're waiting for the clapping at the end to wake them up. And the other half are texting their boyfriends and girlfriends to arrange what they're doing later this evening. Yeah, that's a lecture. So we're not doing that. We're having we're having an intimate talk amongst friends, a heart to heart. <clears throat> Five platonic solids. When the physical universe began, however you believe it did begin, and how you believe it began in some ways is irrelevant, but on the other hand, not. So whether you believe God had a giant pair of compasses, or whether you believe he said, let there be light, or whether you believe there was a big bang, However you describe it, and the, none of these are explanations, they are approximations or intimations, hints. 
Nevertheless, at that starting point, when space came into existence, these five platonic shapes existed. They are fundamental to space, three-dimensional space. There are only five regular three-dimensional shapes that will fit into a sphere. These are they. They've been known for thousands of years, long before Plato himself, but Plato described and published some understanding, so they have his name. Notice that the five are composed out of three shapes, triangles, squares, and pentagons. Three, four, five. A circle and a sphere are the same in the geometry that I understand. One is in two dimensions, one is in three dimensions, but they mean the same thing. They stand for wholeness, they stand for connection, because every point on the circle has a connection, a direct connection with the center. So when we draw geometry in design, the circle is the first thing we do. So those three shapes, triangle, square, pentagon, from them, from the diagonals of those, we get these three proportions. hopefully familiar to you. The diagonals are root 3, root 2, and phi, and modern mathematics calls these numbers irrational, meaning they cannot be rationalized into whole numbers. I prefer to call them magical because it's uh, a rather better description of the mystery that's there because any child can draw them. Any child who has the ability to swing a pair of compasses can make these proportions, but no computer that will ever be invented can do it. It is impossible to do it rationally. So there's a very deep mystery hidden in these simple ratios that any child can draw. If anyone ever tells you that ultimate truth is complicated, then they're looking at the wrong thing. I think ultimate truth is always going to be simple. Uh, one of uh, the treats of visiting your wonderful school of architecture is having Jennifer show me all these rare books which she is so proud of. And I love the fact that she wants the students to use these books as sources of knowledge. I think that's wonderful. Um, so I don't believe Vitruvia, uh, Leonardo's uh, Vitruvian Man was ever published in a Vitruvius. I don't think it was. But this drawing by Leonardo was drawn to explain the human proportions described in Vitruvius. But, um, and some of the uh, Vitruviuses that Jennifer showed me had 
a variety of illustrations like this of the human body within a square. One of them had arms and feet out touching the corners of the square and so on. But Leonardo, apart from the fact that he was an exquisite draftsman, I mean, this is such a beautiful drawing. But he put into it something because he was a smart guy. And I have taken the liberty of drawing a pentagon on his drawing, which he didn't draw, but he indicated because the points of the hands, obviously the axis at the top and the toes on his outstretched feet give you the pentagon. Um, so that was hidden in there. So you've got here in this diagram, you've got three, four, and five. Now, Plato, when he described the faces of the platonic solids, he didn't call them platonic solids, of course. Um, he described the faces thus, the equilateral triangle composed of six similar triangles and the square of four. He didn't actually describe the pentagon, but I'd like to show you something uh, which I found uh, really quite interesting. This is the background illustration is from one of Keith's books and I've drawn onto it in blue, one triangular face of the icosahedron. And in purple, three pentagonal faces of the dodecahedron. And what's remarkable is that if I go back, um, maybe you can't see, but the triangles composing the equilateral triangle and those triangles composing the pentagon are not the same triangles. They don't fit over each other in two dimensions. But lo and behold, if those platonic solids, in this case the icosahedron and the dodecahedron, if they are swollen back to the parent sphere, lo and behold, those triangles become the same. which is, again, on the one hand, you could say that's just fascinating, that's interesting. Wow, nice one. <laughs> or, or you could say, hmm, so I understand you're talking about the circle or the sphere, that's the origin, that stands for the wholeness. And that wholeness gets drawn out to produce something particular. But actually those particulars have within them the ability to go back to the wholeness. Here's three, four, five again. But um, Keith taught us to think about them as threeness, fourness, and fiveness. Because when I say three or four or five, our modern trained intellect will, I think, for all of us, if I can be presumptuous, immediately think of the number three, the number four, the number five. Threeness, fourness, fiveness actually are qualities, they're powers. And only much later on are they numbers that we count with. So this is just to try and illustrate this in 
a couple of ways. There's top left, that's threeness, drawn as a triangle, a series of reducing triangles. This is threeness expressed in a flower. In the center at the top is fourness, imaged as a square. Down below, a flower. Fiveness on the right, and uh, something that I can't quite see, which is probably another flower. Yes, geometers love flowers. Everybody loves flowers, isn't it? Isn't it? Here we are. This is this is um, for me. This is the beginning of my. If I can be so bold as to say, my tradition. Pythagoras. There were at the beginning of our Western civilization. There were some great figures. People like Pythagoras, Parmenides, Empedocles. These were giants. We describe them now as, we label them as philosophers, mathematicians, poets. But actually they were far more than that. There were people back two and a half plus thousand years ago who started Western civilization. Not kind of as a business project. You know, they didn't go around, you know, the traders and collect some money and say, I've got a great idea, Western civilization. Let's give it a go. And uh, who wants to buy shares? No, 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 it's, it doesn't, you don't. If you do that, it doesn't last for two and a half thousand years. Um, and we know that he was very, very interested in number and the way number, not in terms of numbering and counting, Number as pattern, archetypal power, was behind the physical world. This is what they became interested in. The idea that behind the myriad forms that we see and experience with our senses, there were fundamental principles. Today, we would say things like, you know, the laws of physics. It's understood, you know, that behind how things happen, there are laws by which they happen. The quest to understand those in a particular way in our civilization was seeded at this time. And no coincidence that the language that science uses is mathematics because number they understood only in one sense is numbering and counting and so forth although the pure number of as maths that we now understand that they talked about is not the simple maths that we might do it elementary school, we probably would call it higher maths today. But nevertheless, the number, the, the study of number in its pure form, and then number in space is geometry. Number in time is music. Number in space and time is astronomy. And this is how they understood and studied the various ways in, the, in which these archetypal powers, patterns, drove life. And uh, here he is, Pythagoras again, 
drawing away. Um, so this is just to give you an idea, a tiny little hint of what the great people who started Western civilization, the kind of powerful magic that they had, because he seeded something, one of the things he seeded into our civilization was this simple thing that every school kid, even today, studies. Everybody is given this key. Three, four, five triangle. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. So simple. Every school child is given it and then promptly forgets it <laughs> because they're not told anymore. That's to be discovered. That's the lock. This is the key. You've got to find the lock. Otherwise, the key by itself is just a lump of metal. Can you imagine putting an idea out and making sure it'll last for two and a half thousand years? That's quite powerful. Try it. Come back and see if they're still teaching it in two and a half thousand years. It's, I mean, you know, it's, it's actually pretty profound. <coughs> There's more to it than just a handy way of remembering the, how to work out the links of the sides of a triangle, a right angle triangle. Here's just a little hint of what's embedded in that thing. Uh, three plus four plus five is 12, and the product is 60. So how many inches in a foot? How many hours in half a day? How many seconds in a minute? How many degrees in a circle? Actually, 360. But those of you who were with me this afternoon know that there is an inherent sixness in a circle. The radius of a circle walks around six times. So that is brought into this. So six sixties is 360. <coughs> ah, now, I commend this book to you. The Genius of Japanese Carpentry. Do you have this in your library? Hopefully tomorrow you will. It's a fantastic book. Now, this is uh, some images on the left. Uh, this is a Buddhist foundation. Uh, it was built in the end of the 7th century in Japan. There was a fire in the 15th or 16th century, and not much of the complex remained uh, by the, in the middle of the 20th century, and they started a major restoration program. This book is about the building of the picture hall, which is just one of the buildings uh, on, in the complex. Um, quite exquisite workmanship in the carpentry. Unbelievable. Now, there's something really quite profound in the traditional Japanese carpenter's understanding of what he's doing. And here's, here's one thing. This timeline on the right, the yellow line is just time from 
500 BC onwards. The orange line is the life of the building, the temple complex that uh, they're working on. The bottom of the line is when it was first built. The top of the line, 2000, is when they were uh, in the middle of the restoration project. Now, on the left, the green line, which represents 1,300 years, is the length of time it took for the trees to grow that they felled to build the temple at the end of the seventh, end of the beginning of the seventh century. Yeah. Whilst that temple existed and was used, the second green line is the next set of trees that took a thousand to thirteen hundred years to grow, which they then felled in the nineteen seventies and eighties to construct it. And on and on and on. They see this as a continuum, the tree to the building. And this is what, because they have a very religious reverence for the trees. They revere trees. Um, equally, they see that the tree doesn't die when it's felled. It just takes another form. It's still alive in the temple. And this, this is what the carpenters say before they chop a tree. Because for them, that's sacrilege, only permissible. I vow to commit no act that will extinguish the life of this tree. So the felling of it is not killing the tree because the way they use it, the reverence, the relationship they have with the timber, the building that they put it into, the use that the building is put to, all of this means that that tree the timber within it lives. Part two. <laughs> does anyone does anyone recognize what this is a misquote of? Yeah. Well, I wanted to. Um, you know, it's, it's very important now and again to remind yourself why you started this architecture business in the first place. What was it that motivated you to put yourself through 10 years of training and all of that? The onerous duties of being an architect um, for me, it was an experience I had when I was about 11 years old. And, you know, I, in some ways, anyway, um, it's only now that I'm beginning to understand what it was that happened, age 11, and after that, when, oh, what do you want to be when you grow up, Sonny? You know, as old people do to you. I want to be an architect. I had no idea what it meant. <laughs> Probably, luckily. But, um, so what was that experience? That experience was akin to how I've just described the Japanese temple carpenters understanding that the trees still lived in the building. My experience of this building here, which is 
a medieval foundation. So, you know, eight or nine hundred years old, the heart of it. I experienced, I wouldn't have put words to it like this then. I didn't actually know what I was experiencing. I just had an experience. But now I would say I experienced the life of the building, the livingness of that building. And that livingness, if you like, has two components. This is what, how I now understand it. So first of all, there's the life that I, as an architect, put into it. And the only way I know of doing that is by using geometry. Geometry used in a certain way so that it will invoke this sense of life, this sense of livingness. So that's one thing. That's, if you like, creating the building and activating a certain potential a certain life within it. Now there's a second aspect, and this is also what I experienced. This second aspect is that if you spend time in, you live in, a building that is alive, then you put something into that life. You have a relationship. And the building fabric in some mysterious way, which I don't understand, I just feel absorbs some of that exchange. So that how I would now read the experience I had was that I went to that building and I heard the voices, the prayers, the good feelings, of the 800 years that that building had been used. And I thought, yeah, that's good. I want to do that. That's pretty powerful. So some of the work that I've done, um, uh, this is the first building that I worked on with Keith. <coughs> Uh, and all these projects that I'm going to show you are very modest, small projects. I hope you don't mind. I know in America you like things big, is that right? <laughs> Forgive me if I speak out of turn, but anyway, I, I do small, modest projects. But you know what? How the most precious things in life are about that size? Yeah or about that size, yeah. or even dimensionless. So uh, small is beautiful. <coughs> the Krishnamurti Center. Now this is a contract plan, a standard old architect's contract plan. Um, and I should say that all of this geometry that I'm talking about takes for granted that the buildings that you do, if you use geometry, to make them beautiful, of course, they will comply with all the codes, fire safety, you know, client requirements, budgets, all of that stuff. Of course, it's got to do that. Um, so you can see here, there's a room at the top. There's a central enclosed courtyard. Top left and right, two-story wings enclosed in the courtyard. Bottom, single-story, high volume vaulted spaces. And wings off left and right. Architectural plan, standard architectural plan, except if it wasn't a geometric sized plan, it would probably be drawn orthogonally. Anyway, standard plan, but here is a simplified uh, geometric 
diagram which unfolded that building. And in this case, it unfolds from the special room at the top, which is in red there. And the whole building unfolds from that point. And every wall position, room width, everything <coughs> is controlled, taken from the geometry behind it. But of course, none of this is in the contract plan. This is all layers and layers of work, hidden work. Uh, here's another one. This is uh, an artist studio, lovely lady who makes sundials. She's a sculptress. But because she makes sundials, she's really into astronomy and geometry. So we had a lovely time working together. Small, simple building. Very severe planning constraints there, so it had to be a very simplified outside. Um, inside on the left, on the right, is uh, one of the many, many geometric drawings uh, involved, in this case, showing how the roof angle was derived, how the main tie beam was derived. Many other bits of the structure were controlled. And um, what was particularly nice about this job was that because it was such a particular bespoke design for somebody doing really quite special artistic creations, the building is tailored to the client's measurements. So all of the geometry, her physical height is keyed into that. So it's like a tailor-made suit, a tailor-made building for, for her. And um, that's her shadowy figure there. And another one. And this is um, you know, the, the, uh, the sad lot of many architects is that they have unbuilt projects. And this, sadly, is one of them. It would have been lovely to do it, a sketch of it. And I'm just going to show you one aspect of this, which is a lantern. It's an L-shaped building with a lantern lighting down the corner. You can see it in a kind of dirty yellow, the width of the lantern. So that pentagonal construction there is giving you not only the roof pitch, but also the width of this lantern, which on plan, one floor and the other floor is in yellow. So the lantern which rises up out of the roof, um, actually the staircase wraps around it on the one hand, and it's a void down the middle. But you can see top right that the size of that, which on the outside in the section is taken from the pentagonal geometry. Here it's given by a diminishing square root two progression in the center. Another project, probably the smallest project that anyone could do, because it's a single room. It's a tent, a, a quite extraordinary project, because uh, the right-hand picture shows behind the tent a reconstructed medieval 13th century uh, church, which unfortunately was blown up by uh, the IRA when we were at war with them. Uh, they blew the building up. Um, it was a doubly sad day for that poor building because shortly before that, it had been declared redundant as a church. So 
one day it's made redundant, the next day it's blown up. So, you know, a bad week for this building. But, um, so the Bishop of London standing in the rubble of this wonderful little 13th century is inspired to rebuild it and open a center for peace and reconciliation. A phoenix rising from the ashes, if you like. And um, it does really quite remarkable work. Um, and certainly people from the IRA have been here and, and so forth, now that that's been largely healed. But that's not the point of this. The point is to show that even that small little tent, which, sorry, if I go back, you can see this black and white, it's goat hair. Uh, the person who donated the money to build this came from Saudi. And uh, what he offered was to fund the courtyard and the landscaping and the construction and to give us a traditional Bedouin tent to our design. So we put windows, stained glass windows, and so forth in it. But um, that's why this black and white stripes. It's, it's a very lovely, friendly fabric. Although sadly, it lasts better in the dry Saudi Arabian desert than in damp, dank London. So anyway, here we are, a small little landscaped courtyard, not quite perfectly square, but within the perfected square of that, of that garden, the tent is placed so that it has a relationship, a harmony with the site that it sits in. So if you were drawing this, your compass point would in turn be placed on the four corners and arcs from adjacent corner to adjacent corner struck through and the tent is placed in the zone created by those four arcs. And then within the tent itself, the function is really just as a, a talking, an intimate talking place. And this is a place where some pretty tough talking is done. Uh, if you can imagine, um, you know, somebody from ISIS having a conversation with the victims of the atrocities, something like that. You know, people from the Jewish community and people from the Palestinian community. This is the sort of work they do. It's quite remarkable work. So the idea of this uh, room was that it would be a space, a non-hierarchical space. So it's a simple, nearly 16-sided space with a nicely upholstered bench all the way around so that everybody sitting there is equal. And not so big that, you know, you're having to shout, but not so small that you're not intimidated by somebody who you might initially feel is your enemy. So that space was just sort of judged to be just right. So, and what you can see if your eyesight is very acute is that there are four spinning circles within the shape of that space. The, the corners of all of those squares touch the inside of the tent and the sides of the squares give you the edge of the bench seat. 
very simple, but why would you not make a space like that as harmonious as possible? Yes, and the art barn. Um, this is the Brockwood Park School, and the students burnt down their art room. Um, students used to do things like that, when, but I, I think they all better behave these days, don't you? Michael certainly hopes so. Um, so we were asked to design a new art barn, which was a lovely thing to do because what we realized was that they would be in there making paintings and drawings and so forth. So we wanted to make a building that kind of was artistic. Um, there's an interior shot on the left, and I just want to, um, you can't see terribly well, but can you see that window there? There's a series of windows down in the shadow there. And there's a drawing of the front. You can see the five uh, window screens there. There's a whole lot of geometry proportioning all of that very carefully. Um, but, and here are some sections. You know, the um, one, two, three, I mean, what's the important thing here, here is to say that um, geometry, using geometry to proportion a building isn't just using, you know, one, re one ratio or something like that. It's, it's a, it's, which is, if you like, using one chord. One chord doesn't make a piece of music. Yeah. So geometry is, is a compositional exercise. So there are many, many layers of geometry all working on top of each other. And here's a drawing of that window screen. And when I was preparing this talk, I realized that I show this drawing in my slides often. And I've never asked anyone what it means to them. Because I would imagine that it probably doesn't mean very much to you. Maybe I'm being unfair, but what this drawing is, is if you like a composite. It's a bit like seeing, it's a bit like hearing music, but compressed into a single sound. It wouldn't make much sense. In a sense, this is what's happening here. So what I've done, is to show you, if you like, the process of designing this window. And it's, it's not one process, it's a toing and froing until it's right. But here we are, the square here is the, the overall square of that window screen, given by the proportioning of the section and the elevation that's already gone on, so that's established a certain size for that screen. And there's a circle around it. So that's the first step. And then that square, of course, is a certain dimension, an exact dimension. So we know more or less the sizes of the frame and the casements that we're using. And this wasn't just one simple exercise of design, there was coming and going, because there's flexibility in how exactly how big the frame timbers are and so forth. But having established that, the corners of the glazing give you an equilateral triangle, which establish one line, where it crosses the diagonals of the square. And here's a circle which touches another significant line and also gives 
a center line of the glazing of the side frames. And that circle gives you three centers to construct the arch above. And the main embracing circle itself gives you another center that gives you the counter curve. And the whole thing gets built up. So if you like, that's one sweep through. But also, at the end of all this, it's important that each individual rectangle of glazing is also proportioned. So the left and right hand casement, which have this uh, pink rectangle in, that is a proportion. The central casement with the blue, blue nearly squares, they're not quite squares, they are all one. So they have to work. So if they didn't work, you go back and work through. So this is a backwards and forwards process. And equally, it still doesn't work unless those window panes are actually in the right place. So that whether you're a child or an adult, seated or standing, equally, you want to be looking through a window pane rather than looking at a glazing bar. So that has to work too. And that's just one window. So that kind of touched on a point really, but this is slightly more specifically geometrical. And I mentioned this in the class this afternoon. The idea that if you're using geometry to help you design your building, it's not just a matter of the building fabric itself being beautifully proportioned and resonant and harmonious. It also has the ability, the capability, the opportunity for the geometry that is controlling, uh, generating the shapes and curves of the building itself to relate to the building users walking through, occupying that building. And here's a way of just trying to image that. Uh, this is Saturn with its rings. And if you've looked into what this extraordinary disk of rings is, it's really quite amazing because it's a very, very, very thin disk of billions of ice chunks of very, all various sizes. They're all orbiting around, banging into each other. Um, but it's not one disk. This disk has actually got these gaps in it. So it's more like an old-fashioned vinyl record. Yeah, it's got these grooves in it. And how have these grooves come about? They've come about by the, um, the, what do you call it, the gravitational pull of the various moons of Saturn coming into certain geometric alignments which intensify the gravitational pull just momentarily and the point in this vast disk where that gravitational concentration is focused gets pinged. And the ice particles there get bounced out. And over time, because the point of the ping is repeated over 
you know, millions of years, those gaps have been um, formed and maintained. So in a sense, and that's an analogy to what a building is doing to the people. The geometry in a building, if it's a good building, is pinging the people. And that's a good thing, by the way. That's all right. Being pinged is okay. Um, because what is pinging you? If geometry is pinging you, geometry is wholeness health. So every time you're pinged, you're being reminded of something quite profound and magical, whether you know it or not. So I think I'm just going to now, I'm on part three. Some more general thoughts about architecture. The word itself, uh, the misspelling, by the way, is deliberate. This is a nice way of understanding architecture. This is the top line. According to the view I'm going to give you, the vast, vast majority of buildings that are put up today are not architecture. They're just buildings. Some of them exquisitely designed bits of industrial design, whatever it is, but they're not architecture to the extent that they don't mean anything. The archi of architecture refers to the archetypal dimension. This is the dimension where things are given meaning outside of our individual opinions and preferences. This is the realm where things of permanent value are found. So if something is referenced to the archetypal realm, it is given a meaning which is outside personal preference. It's objective. It's not a subjective thing. So that's the archie of architecture. For me, it's got to hit that high note. Tech is, you know, fairly obvious technology, technique, the making, the fabrication, and so forth. And you're the ground, the context, the physicality. Tradition, I mean, this is, tradition is a word that I can use here at Notre Dame, and I think it means something. It wouldn't be a bad smell in the room where it would be in some schools of architecture. Um, the continuum of tradition, I, I, I just love that Japanese idea of the building as being a continuum. Um, so, this idea that a tradition is a continuum of practice. Continual renewal was how Kathleen Rain described tradition. And working with the Prince's Foundation, I spent three or four uh, times in New Orleans, which I have to say is one of my favorite places in the world, uh, a most wonderful place. Um, and in the programs that uh, we did there, came across this extraordinary master mason called Teddy Pierre. And this is what he said about tradition. When I'm using brick, I feel a primordial connection with all previous masons throughout time and culture. I want to keep that connection going. This is just a simple, humble New Orleans mason. 
thinks that. So what should be your top line as architects, as master architects? You should be hopefully aspiring to something at least as good as that. Because that, I think, is just unbelievable. I hope you agree. Do you, do you agree? I mean, if all the Masons <coughs> built like that, do you know what he said? He said, when I go on site in the afternoon, I can tell whether my Masons who built that piece of brickwork in the morning, I can tell whether they were in a good mood or a bad mood. You know, so if that is what a wall can be, you know, that gives you some sense of what is possible, I hope. Ah, originality, innovation, I hate these words. I hate innovation especially. You know, the idea that being different for the sake of it is being creative. I mean, that's what... Hmm. Anyway, let's not go there. Originality, for me, means connection, relationship. So, I've just shared with you, in a sense, the origin of why I became an architect. It was this particular experience. Um, each of you will have an origin for your architectural practice. Each project will have an origin, an inspiring idea. Um, even before we talk about you know, anything spiritual, religious. Here's another way of saying the same thing. This is our circle. So, lost in space. This is what most creative people today have been kind of brainwashed into thinking they should be doing. Something different, something that's never been done. Be original, be creative, innovate. But from my point of view, that's just lost in space. It doesn't relate to anything. It doesn't have any meaning. Meaning, if meaning means anything, it relevant to a conversation, it doesn't mean simply what I say is its meaning. You know, that's, that's meaningless. As I say, that has meaning. That has meaning. You say that has meaning. We don't get very far. Meaning, if it has any value, is something that we can share, that's something that's outside the particular individual. And this is exactly what geometry embeds into everything you do using geometry. Knowledge, data, Information, slightly higher, but information technology is still low down the ladder. Knowledge, wisdom. This is significant, I think, the line at the bottom. Wisdom, Sophia. It's feminine. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <clears throat> but this is, uh, as I lay asleep, not asleep, as I lay awake last night, I couldn't sleep last night. Um, jet lag or Cuban coffee, I'm not quite, quite sure which, probably, probably that damn Cuban coffee, delicious. It didn't kick in. Where's Jennifer, Adam, are they here? Wait. Took about eight hours to kick in last night. So, um, so I I was envision, envisioning how to describe the difference between knowledge and wisdom, and I came up with this: when a knowledgeable person enters the room, they bring with them a library of knowledge. Behind them, there are these shelves full of books, some of, them, some of them dusty, some of them well-thumbed. So somebody asks a question and 
he's able to draw from really quite extensive <laughs> knowledge. Uh, in contrast, a wise person enters the room. If you're ever lucky enough to meet a wise person, you know what they come into the room with? Oh no, absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing. But that emptiness that they bring is so powerful that the whole universe is available to them. And if somebody asks a question, they can pull anything from anywhere. That's a wise person. Top line, bottom line. The top line. Do you want to know the real? Do you want to know the real bottom line? Because the real bottom line is that there is a top line. And actually, in the fullness of time, things are judged only by the top line. Of course, you know, we, we work somewhere in the middle. The accountants and so forth are pulling us down all the time. The bottom line, they have this obsession with the bottom line. You know, but uh, legal obligations and so forth. And hopefully, hopefully your aspiration as an architect is something um, equal to or a bit above Teddy Pierre's vision. That's your top line. Yeah? You might not quite get there all the time, but that's what's pulling you, motivating you, hopefully. And, um, yeah, buildings built with that quality tend to last. I always remember an engineer we were working with on a project where the client said, I want this building to last for a thousand years, uh, which is quite an onerous technical requirement. Um, the engineer who's very mature and very smart guy said, well, well, what do you mean by last? Because if you're saying that the physical fabric must be here in a thousand years' time, no matter what's thrown at it, then you're talking about you know, a nuclear bunker or solid, massive concrete or something. But that's not a building. And then he very cleverly uh, cited the example of Hagia Sophia in Istanbul. And he said, look, here's a building that's 1,500 years old. And it's had 11 earthquakes over that time. And it's been patched up, rebuilt, so forth, so that today it is standing. And the reason it's standing is, he didn't say this, but I would now say this to bring it into the slide, because it was built according to the top line. It had those values in it that the community, over the course of 1,500 years, you know, however many generations, they would rebuild it, you know, from the ground if necessary, because it had that value. That's lasting. Oh, yeah. And nearly done. Geometry, a definition for today. Well, if you like definitions, here's one. So these are the components of geometry as practiced today as, as I would explain it. And there's a, certainly the necessity of technical precision. If you do it, you will soon realize that if your technique is not sharp, your concentration is not sharp, pencil lead is not sharp, you won't 
be able to do it. Then, of course, it's in the service of proportional composition. That's why you're doing it. So there's an uh, element of creativity necessary. Um, maybe many different ways of saying the third point. Meditation or mindfulness, hopefully that'll do. So there's a sense of Hmm. If you want your buildings to sing, if you want the geometry that you put into your buildings to really have life, then it will do to the extent that you are mindful or focused on what you need to be focused on when you're doing it. And then the last value is that because geometry is the art of the ever true, because it's this eternal science, if you like, then what is accumulating in the tradition of uh, the use of geometry is the wisdom of the ages. It's all there. It's all accumulated. And actually, there's another image that came to me to explain tradition, which I think is quite nice. The image of a tree. A tradition is like a tree. The roots are in the ground, nourished by the ground. And the ground, if you like, is the accumulated wisdom and knowledge of that tradition. And then the leaves of the tree are each one of you individual practitioners. And the light of your work nourishes the tree that way. That's what, it, and the tree is growing and is living. And then when you die, your leaf goes, falls down to the ground. It becomes soil. It's part of what nourishes the root. So that's how I see tradition. It's a wonderful circular thing. And the last slide. The left image is a group portrait of the earth, including all of us. It's an earth selfie, if you like. On the right hand side is each and every one of us. How we start. That's a human egg. Each one of us starts. And I I think there's a lovely affinity there in the it's the same same thing. We are the earth, the earth. we are the microcosm. The earth is the mesocosm. And um, so I'm gonna ask you to do one more thing. I hope I haven't pressed you too far. You've listened with your heart, I hope. Most of you are still awake, so we don't need to clap. Clapping breaks the spell. So at the end, of, we're going to have some quest time for questions. You can clap to your heart's content then if you must. But right now, I finished talking until I answer questions, but if you must thank anybody, thank yourself for listening. And please wave if you must, but <laughs> let's not clap. It's a horrible, violent thing to do. Thank you. Let's, <laughs> good. <laughs> listen, are we gonna have some questions? Yeah. So listen, we got um, some questions. Questions.
anyone has any questions. I might or might not have answers. Ah, that's good. <laughs> In one of your earlier slides, you put up music as proportionally time. You ever studied proportions in musical works? You did four symphonies from a small. No. No. Um, are you a musician? Not much. Are you an architect? You're studying music. So let's say you are a musician. So that's, yeah. Um, ooh. No, I'm afraid not. Um, I mean, you. It's it's nice that you ask because Pythagoras is sent is said to have discovered the mathematics behind music by. You know the tuning of, so it's kind of it's in there. Um, if I know how to get in touch with you, I'll ask and pass on what I can find out. Um, and then there's there's uh, Mr. Google as well, of course. Yeah, so, sorry I can't give you more. Yeah. Okay, that's a good start. Roger Stewart. <laughs> and Malcolm Stewart. Mm. In fact, Malcolm Stewart is in a book right here. Mm. Malcolm Stewart, well, um, check him out online. Probably take, yeah, he's, he's, a, he's a lovely guy. He's talking next Sunday in London, if you're there. Um, yeah. Sorry, any more? Well, Lucy. Yeah, you, you worked, uh, you told us that you worked like 15 months in India on the, on the major project, and also you was that a new video? Also, it was a slow picture. Or was that not a project? No, no, it's not a project. Yeah. Practical project. You showed the small project, but you had also some larger projects. You could like see the picture of the larger projects. Can you talk about a little bit about your activities in India? How long have you got? <laughs> I love India. Um, The reason I didn't show the hospital project, for example, which, as you can imagine, when Keith designed it, there was a lot of geometry into it. Um, the circumstances in which we, the building, the hospital was built, were such that the contractors took over at a certain point and we were not allowed to get involved. It was a 300 bed tertiary hospital doing advanced surgeries and cancer treatments and so forth, 300 beds, you know, a reasonable size thing. Um, we were given the go ahead to design it and told that the first open heart operation would take place in 12 months time. Um, I mean, in the UK, it's just unthinkable. It would take you three times that just to get planning permission, you know, let alone construction, let alone commissioning. It would take a year to commission a hospital like that with all this, you know, million dollar x-ray machines. And goodness knows, I mean, impossible. It happened. It happened 12 months to the day they did a, an open heart surgery. 
So they didn't want architects messing around with the construction. So not all of our refinements got built. The heart of it sort of in a sense was there, but so it doesn't illustrate my proposition terribly well. Oh, that was, uh, that was Amazon. Or half-trained architect. Uh, we ha I don't know how, how you do it here, but in the UK you do a degree, then you have a year out, a time out in practice in an office, and then you go back and do a postgraduate thing, then you do another office period, and then you take your final professional qualification. So I did an extended year out after my degree in India, with a roll of 100 scale drawings and a return ticket and an address. And um, it was an extraordinary experience. And nothing was done in any way remotely as it was in the UK. Uh, so, um, hmm, well. It was completely different, but I somehow stumbled through and we ended up <coughs> with a building there. Um, quite quite interesting, I suppose, you know, the, the something to say about that would be that um, it really made me appreciate how difficult and inappropriate it can be to go to another culture, another country, and attempt to impose your way of doing things. It's, it's very difficult and disrespectful. And I had to learn, in India, it's done this way. And I would shout and bang the table and so forth, and it didn't make the slightest bit of difference. If they said, if I said, I want this tomorrow, they would say yes, and it would turn up in three weeks' time. It always was going to turn up in three weeks' time, but I just said, it must come tomorrow. Yes, sir. It'll come tomorrow. <laughs> and it won't. But um, now I tell you what was nice about it for a young architect was getting closely involved in um, building something. Wonderful experience. We, the bricks were made on site. The earth was dug up and fired. You know, sixty percent of the bricks were no good because they weren't properly baked, but there was enough, and we did and built another. And it was it was extra, and we made all the windows and doors. So um, I chose, you know, shown went to the timber yard and chose half a dozen logs like that. I had no idea, so I I would say, okay, to my interpreter, ask them, you know. What this is like, is this good? And a sort of 15 minute conversation would ensue in which I, are they working out what the cut is, what the deal is? Are they talking about their grandmothers? Are they, are they insulting me? And is, is my interpreter explaining that, no, you know, just tell them double the cost and we'll split the difference. He won't know, you know, stupid English person. And then they, you know, so I had no idea, but. Wow, you know, the experience of actually choosing a log and then saying, working out what sizes I needed to convert it to and taking it and watching them convert it and then, yeah, it's a great experience. Hmm. Any more questions? Okay. Yes, Michael.
Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>